A new class of stents have been designed to accommodate the significant mechanical stresses associated with the, the bending, the motion, and the rotation of the knee. And we're here to talk about the stent and the new trial that goes along with it. I'm with Dr. Lawrence Garcia, steward, St. Elizabeth's Medical Center in Boston. I started out in this area writing a book called Save Your Knees years ago, and so I am very familiar with the, the, the hazards in that area. This is a whole new stent idea, correct? It is. It's one of the uh, departures from what has always been designed as a scaffold-only approach to the knee, and more of a uh, biologic, mimetic type of stent, which is an interwoven nitinol stent, which allows for the conformability of the stent to actually mimic what the artery in its native state is trying to do. And it does two things that are incredibly unique. It maintains a radial force that is about five times greater than any of the other stents, but it has also dissociated itself from that radial force and maintains a incredible uh, conformability to the anatomy that it is uh, involved in. And as you point out, the uh, SFA and into the popliteal segments are really an inhospitable place to actually put a uh, endoprosthesis. And this stent not only maintains its radial force, but also then allows itself to uh, bend and tours with the uh, lower limb without losing that radial strength or uh, kinking, which is a remarkable departure from most other stents. Well, in earlier permutations of stenting, I mean, we had the strides and the Scirocco, and the success rate was just not all that impressive. So what, what are you finding with this new, uh, this new stent? Well, two things. Those two trials that you point out are, are driven by uh, drug illusion. And uh, the drug illusion, um, hope, um, got us somewhere, but in those early trials didn't pan out. Correct. The more recent study, uh, Zilver PTX, hit a primary endpoint uh, of about 83% using about a 5 centimeter uh, lesion length. Um, this trial, which was driven against what's called the Viva OPG, uh, which is um, a way in which the FDA allows uh, new stents to be um, tested against the historic controls of angioplasty. Most trialists agree that randomization now for angioplasty alone probably is not the right choice. So we go up against this uh, Viva OPG, and that's how this stent was, was done. And if you take the original DES or even other stent trials which have looked at this uh, as a primary outcome, the average number of uh, Zilver was about 83% and other trials below that in a primary patency. This trial uh, showed a primary patency at the end of one year of 86%. And so not only does it trump a lot of the other trials clearly in the bare metal stent, but it also trumps uh, those trials that you were pointing out which are drug eluding stents. And it may actually uh, indicate a departure now from uh, what standard tech, stent technology should be looked at when it comes to a primary patency in the SFA. And I think this stent, and in this trial, we've actually tried to prove that, and I think we did. So in what settings would you approach, uh, approach a patient now and suggest this be an appropriate use? Well, that's a great question. I think that most of us look at the SFA in, in various locations. There's a, the upper third, the middle third, and the lower third. And as you get down towards the knee is where a lot of the gymnastics occurs in that <laughs> artery. Oh, yes. Yeah. And so one of the challenges is that m most of the trials have always looked to the top of the, uh, above the knee, so to keep it relatively straight. This trial shows that that stent does that location incredibly well. It's 86%. But now you have a series of other signals from single center studies, which are not small in group number. For example, uh, our colleagues in, in Germany have presented their uh, Leipzig data uh, looking specifically at the knee. And in that group, again, six to eight centimeters in total lesion length come out very high in the mid 80s as a primary patency. And so I think that that signal is now validated by the prior superb study, which uh, in combination tell you that this stent works in the SFA and then on through to the knee. And these are two areas that are critical to what we do as, as uh, you know, interventionalists, as, as plumbers working down in the leg. I think it becomes critical that we have to have a, a good technology that does what it says it does and does it incredibly well, but is also a durable outcome. And I think Superb really does try to prove that. So you have 30 day and one year? One year, one year data, and uh, this trial will actually be followed out uh, per the FDA mandate for three years. So the real key will be what happens at year two and year three, and as I call it, you'll either see a, a soft landing, that is that the primary patency will be maintained over time, and the two-year and three-year data in these larger single-center studies have shown that to be a soft landing, uh, or you'll see a, a decline. 
Our plan will be uh, to show the data at the end of three years now and look at what our primary patency is in this entire cohort. The robust cohort is uh, 8.1 centimeters, one of the largest trials you'll see in lesion length, 256 patients that were uh, put into that trial. And the outcomes, I think, are very good, not only from an efficacy standpoint in the 99.6% safety endpoint at 30 days, but now this 86% primary patency at the end of one year. The goal will be to see where it lands at uh, three years. And Dr. Lawrence Garcia is presenting the data here at TCT, and you can read more about it in CardioSource Interventional News. I'm the executive editor, Rick McGuire. Thanks.